to um, carry on that conversation in a more kind of spatial form. Uh, I'll leave uh, Dominic to that time. I'm going to talk about space. And, and just look at the idea of innovation in the service set economy uh, within the kind of role of architectural reasoning. Down is up. I forgot. Um, I think it's interesting to just speculate, and this is what I'm trying to do here, is speculate on the challenge of what this potential new merger of metropolitan region will really mean as it becomes a more kind of complex urban field. And how do we actually reflect on the growing importance of some type of network driven innovation and that leads on from this idea of Dominique was talking about in terms of clusters or nodes and how do we start to differentiate that, that, that matrix or network. I think we're all seeing actually that the provision of services necessary for innovation um, are no more exclusively provided by the isolated park operator of the kind of second generation innovation environment. Instead, what we're seeing is actually industry networks themselves are increasingly become service orientated. Crossovers between business linkages and civic networks are becoming paramount. Consequently, industries and regions are becoming much more recognised as urban social systems. And I think what's interesting here is actually. In London, this is, um, oops, this is Bloomsbury and Fitzrovia, and we have the kind of international connections and transport from King's Cross to St. Pancras Station here. This is a large road that takes you into kind of each regional network, and then we have <laughs> lots of figures, giants. Um, and right underneath here, we have a kind of a, a, an urban area. Um, that is, that is broken down and sort of this idea of kind of how you can deliver an inner city innovation environment that is much more like a mature city. It's not a, it's not a campus anymore. This actually contains University of London, a massive hospital, another biomedical that's dispersed within an urban grain field that actually breaks down in scale from, from regional access through to neighbourhood and delivering housing as well. So I think there's a recognition that an area's mobility and at the scale of the district or the neighbourhood, the micro-mobility that Larry was talking about is important in the service of the emergence of more civic and social networks. And you can see here, it's just the, the differentiation, this is a very old drawing from Louis Kahn, but you can see that the understanding of differentiation and what that delivers and the try and trace these kind of civic and social networks. Um, and, and it's also clearly represented for us in places, mature kind of urban environments like Soho. Now, we fell foul last weekend about somebody actually thinking that we wanted to put Soho in uh, Taipei or Nangun. This is not what we're saying. What we're saying here is that there's a, a rich and diverse network that's supported by a mobility plan and a spatial grid that can actually deliver small uh, sort of working environments, workspace urbanism of small and media companies that can actually collaborate to create, create kind of a community of competence that can compete at an international global level against Sony and Disney. But it's actually supported by very old social and sort of market-led housing, which has always been there. And it's this kind of parallel ecology that takes place and so it makes it a very interesting urban environment. At the same time, what you're getting within this diverse sort of grid is you're getting large foundations and institutions that are actually supporting the smaller companies and, and actually working with the bigger institutions such as the university and the hospital itself. At the same time, you're getting just daily life of restaurants and bars, transport infrastructure, delivery, and so it becomes a very rich urban neighbourhood. Therefore, we're recognising that urban life, whether it be civic, recreational, residential, or learning, is key to developing robust, flexible, dynamic working networks and ecologies. Oops. 
The spatialization of this workspace-centered innovation needs to reflect on this evolution. And something that we speculate on is actually what can architecture and urban design do and bring to this discussion of speculation. And I think this is just looking at Cambridge and Oxford and how one can see institutional and collegiate space that's actually in close proximity to more social learning and living environments. Almost a you know, cheap and jowl, as we say, right up against each other. Technical malfunction. So I think it's good to look at some of the key shifts in understanding the urbanization of innovation. And this is not all of them, but it's just talking about the exclusion, moving from exclusion, the campus model, to complementarity. That's a difficult word to say. Where residential communities and civic institutions are vital for innovation. Where foundations of professional organisations like the Wellcome Institute and Soro Iran are as important to the innovation process as ancient countries. And increasing the recognition of the importance of mobility, as uh, Dominique was saying, where networks of innovation depend on highly effective systems of mobility and communication. So, in innovation environments such as One North, which is in Singapore, we can recognise that there is a focus on workspace and network building, the articulation and effective links of spaces and activities and learning cultures require, there's diversity and inclusivity, there's dynamic and responsive, and these projects are restructured really around contemporary transformation of working life. The projects are of a certain scale, they show the importance of building parts of the city. They also show us the value of articulating urban elements and creating a kind of form of fabric of social synergy. When we look at fabric, pattern, and morphology, that Lawrence was talking about earlier, it's how we begin to look at the inclusion of housing in workspace based urbanism. I think it's interesting to look at your own city and see how, you know, how do we start to break down these barriers that are actually compounded elements within the city that have no real relationship beyond the boundary of wall, isolated them themselves, waiting for something to come right up against them. Um, and understanding actually that the network city is already here, as John Wellington was saying. Can we learn from existing associations and patterns in the towns and cities? And it's just looking at the fabric we already have, understanding the innovation that's already taking place, and how can we instrumentalise this? So, how does housing, what does housing do really in relationship to innovation environments? Well, it supports urbanity and supports sustainability, it establishes networks of trust and patterns of engagement. It brings living culture and intergenerational institutions. We talked about this increasing aged population. It supports the volatile business of innovation. And it, it brings value, it reduces risk. Again, going back to this idea of the volatile business of innovation, it reduces risk by creating multiple stakeholders. Smaller wins early on, rather than big, big risky wins. It brings mobility, it brings services and civic amenities that we all understand as being part of our living environments. It also supports sustainable energy. It uses energy at some of the times of the day when innovation environments aren't working. It's the office hours versus the, uh, versus the living hours. It brings passive surveillance and security. You live in your home, you look out onto the street. That means you prevent things from happening that you don't want to happen. It can actually bring a contextual response and malleability. It can bring mix that you can't necessarily achieve within traditional forms of, of, of working environments. It brings additional amenities and recreation and minimises risk, as I said before. What are the key trends that are emerging? Well, what's happening is there's increasingly kind of overlaps between um, living and working and playing. There's not sort of live work, but sort of networks of entrepreneurialism. And I think we have to take into consideration the global talent migration and the need for offering affordable housing for young. And it's interesting there's a whole new kind of mix, some coming back to New York, which is called the Melrose Place uh, concept, which probably not a lot of you know about. It's a TV program about 30 year olds living in a collective environment in LA. There are developers that are actually making these projects now. And what are the kind of civic amenities and support amenities commensurate with 
a large young population, urban professionals who are coming in and, and want, wanting to work and find cheaper housing. Can we actually start to speculate on new models where ideas of club, guest rooms, houses and service departments are part of a new form of working ecology that brings workspace and living and social amenity together? Can we unlock the issues of public and collective space that we see in the city of Kaohsiung, where you have a fantastic piece of greenery which has been dug up by a digger and you actually end up with just a strip? Or you have this fantastic amenity which is basically walled off for a privileged few? So, can housing actually, can housing typology help to articulate new forms of city life? This is a building in Groningen, in the north of the Netherlands. Well, at least I think one of you will know. But um, it starts to actually open up, become spaces at different scales, and delivers different types of scale of space, different types of privacy in terms of publicness or collectiveness, or the privileged spaces that John was talking about. It delivers a whole variety of uses within two buildings, supermarkets, patios, playgrounds, Gardens, police station, cafes, houses, into urban blocks. It brings vertical and horizontal mix and delivers differentiated spaces of public, collective, and private space. And it can act as a transitional space in the city and the inner periphery. So it starts to mediate between one-storey buildings and eight-storey buildings. It's working very hard to sort of nestle into the city, so it's actually quite a large building. How can a tower engage with the ecology of the ground and open up a more public and mixed urban life? Again, we saw buildings which are walled off. Can the tower actually engage in a much more developed understanding of how it can hit the ground and actually engage with an existing ecology of workspace? To deliver something that's different on the ground that is on the top and in the middle. Or, as we see in Hamburg, another type of way of doing that, which is actually bringing the tower and the corporate headquarters of Lever together in a new sort of relationship. Can housing bring affordable market housing together? Can bring more balanced communities and amenities? Or can we create a finer grain of residential community forged by lifestyle? I think the transformation of the grid through new forms of civic space is also something. Looking at civic space and how that can be transformed and what that means to us today. And I think looking at Seattle here, where the, the problems of civic space at the moment with the towers and the grid of Seattle, you end up with small boxes on the edge. And I think what uh, May and Rancourt does very well is, is inflex the public space of the street into the grid and opens up the grid to form new spaces and new typology of civic space. Public space comes into the building, gives you unexpected possibilities. It's not just about the library, it's the idea of books against the wall, and light above the books, and people sitting at desks, which is a traditional and prescriptive form. But actually gives you unexpected views of the city, new gazes at Seattle, and new understandings of civic space, social space, social learning. space into the building. How can we learn from new spatial lessons, from the idea of service orientation with industry as well? And this is actually an interesting headquarters building in Nangan, in Taipei, GTAC headquarters. It brings transparency and new civic spaces, just like King's Place that John, John Wellington was talking about into the building. Unlike the Sinshu Science Parks, it actually starts to integrate itself within the life of Nanga and forms a new kind of typology that looks at the urban block that actually starts to drag you through as a kind of mediating and transitional building between two distinct neighbourhoods. Um, I'm repeating
it's exactly what John was saying in terms of King's Play, so I'll sit past this. And then schools, as Marion Warren was talking about, schools are becoming increasingly more civic and more continuous learning environments. They become more than just a place for education for kids. They become multifunctional. Colleges have become new catalysts for urban regeneration in uh, under underdeveloped parts of the city that bring new civic communities and public learning spaces into the building, cafe, auditorium. Schools are engaging with cultural and business sectors. Buildings are coming to the street, they're creating galleries, they're creating gymnasiums that are actually um, accessible other times of the day by other parts of the community. Certain parts of the school are opening up to business, business, local businesses that have their own entrance and occupy more forum, more ancient like spaces that we understand the traditional school to be. And I think schools are becoming complete learning systems. It's a study for a school in, in Amsterdam that looks at really the idea of the school becoming a kind of social condenser, bringing in all different types of uses that engages with the, the private sector and the community. It teaches you how to cut your hair and you can actually go and cut your hair there as well. Which I wouldn't trust anybody who's learning to cut your hair to cut your hair and pay for it at the same time. But anyway, but it's a fantastic educational experience. Um, but they've also added 30% more, which is actually 70% school, 30% other, a church, housing, shopping. And they are becoming increasingly engaged and complementing a kind of a, a larger regional urban structure, a metropolitan structure, that creates kind of the same diagram, quite different types of school because they're responding. Schools are becoming more key elements in an urban framework deciding how the actual framework works. So the school becomes located as a central element within a growing master plan, as an adaptability, so it can grow and shrink, but at the same time it's forming a major new route through that has shops, school, housing, and gardens on top of each other. And finally, kind of car park building becomes a flexible platform for a new public landscape cafe, music and retail. This is a shop on the fifth floor of a, of a car park in Miami. Band setting up in a cafe. So the cars aren't always there, so why should it just be a concrete shell? And these be new forms of social learning environments that start to make uh, innovation um, part of the urban landscape. Thank you very much.